Good evening. Welcome to our program. This is the Word and Sword broadcast brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ at 650, that meets at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. And we're just glad that you've tuned in tonight. Thank you so much for your time. And we know you could be a lot of places, but you're here and we hope you'll stay with us as we go through the subject tonight of the translations of the Bible. Uh, how did we get so many different translations? How do you know your translation is, is an accurate translation? And indeed, can we know uh, whether our translations are accurate or not? Uh, is there only one translation that is accurate and all the rest of them are not? Um, and if so, why? And so we're going to be talking about that tonight. So uh, give us your attention as we go through our program tonight. The operators are standing by. This is a live broadcast. 828-485-5555 is the number. We'll be scrolling on the right low, uh, lower left hand, or lower right hand corner of the screen throughout the night. And we want to let you know that the operators are uh, uh, available tonight and that to take your questions. You can call in, ask for a copy of the presentation for a free correspondence course, a free tract. You can ask for a map to the building. You can ask to be added to the mailing list of the, of the uh, bulletin for the Newton Church of Christ. And also, if you can, you, you can arrange a personal Bible study. <clears throat> there are so many people that um, they're, they're Bible readers, but they're not Bible students. And so if you'd like to study the Bible with someone, we would arrange that in, uh, in an appropriate place where everyone could feel comfortable. And we'd be most glad to do that in your home or out in public, whatever it might be at a meetup type of situation. Just let us know. We'd be glad to have a Bible class with you. The website of the Newton Church of Christ is www.wordandsword.com. www.wordandsword.com. And also, you can call in tonight with a biblical Bible question, and hopefully we'll be able to give you a book, chapter, and verse answer for that question. And we do encourage you to call in tonight. We had some called in last week. We're going to deal with some of those questions uh, that were a residue from last week uh, to begin the program tonight. You can like us on Facebook by going to www.facebook.com slash word and sword and also leave and post a question there if you would like or also facebook.com slash Newton North Carolina Church of Christ. So follow us on Twitter at word and sword, post a note there and we'll get back with you. Also you can just write a plain old uh, letter if you'd like and we'll take care of that too. So call in tonight. The number again is 828-485-5555. And we invite you to the assemblies of the Newton Church of Christ at 656 St. James Church Road. Assembly times are on Sunday at 930. Worship time is at 11. Wednesday night Bible study is at 7. And we invite you to come and be with the brethren there. The Word and Sword is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ and we encourage you not to send any money. Okay, uh, Do not send any money to uh, the Newton Church of Christ nor to the station here. We don't want your money. We're just trying to study the Bible with people and trying to get them to do what God has told them to do. But it is your choice to do what God said or to not do what God has said. But God has certainly informed us of what we need to do in order to come live with Him eternally. You can contact the Newton Church of Christ by going to email at contact at wordandsword.com and also by phone at 828-485-3009. I think that's 465, not 8. Pardon me. And then by mail by P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina, 28658. Again, the website is www.wordandsword.com. What does it take to be saved? This is a chart that we will continue to use and use and use and use because it is the most important question that anybody could ever ask is what should I do? You'll hear a lot of answers to that question today, a lot of different answers that people give you on what you must do to be saved. And some will tell you all you have to, you can't do anything. God's already done it for you. It's pre it's pre planned, pre ordained. Uh, foreordained that you would either be saved or lost and you can't do a thing about it. Well, that's not true. Uh, that's not what the Bible teaches. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, came to die for all men. And there is not just a chosen few out there. And so it's not a fatalistic idea that you're either born saved or lost and you can't do anything about it. 
you can make a choice. In James, John, in James chapter 1, we see that God does not cause anybody to sin, but each one of us is tempted when we're drawn away by our own lusts, and we are enticed, and then we end up going into sin. But it's our choice whether we sin or whether we don't. It's also our choice whether we obey the Lord or not. In John chapter 12, verse 48, we see there that we're supposed to hear the words of the Lord. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing the Word of God. In John chapter 8 and verse 24, Jesus says, except you believe that I am He, you will all die in your sins. Romans 10, 10, we know that with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Galatians 3, 26, without faith it's impossible to please Him. For he that comes to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith it's impossible to please God. In Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, um, we see that, that the Lord commands us to repent. In Acts 17 and verse 30, Paul tells the Athenians that the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to come to repentance. You've got to change your wickedness. You can't just keep living wicked. Repentance involves not only a change of mind, but a change of heart that moves you toward a change of action. So, we have to put aside the things we've been doing that are sinful. So many people think all they have to do is tell the Lord they're sorry, and then just go on doing like they want to. No, that's not repentance. Repentance means being truly sorry for what you've done, and doing everything in your power to try to do differently. Well, confession. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 32, that if we confess Him before men, He'll confess us before His Father in Heaven. In Acts 8, 27-39, we know the eunuch confessed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And we must confess with our mouth that Jesus is the Son of God in order to go to Heaven. And most people will agree with the first four of these, the ones we've just gone through. But when we get to the subject of baptism, there's a great deal of controversy about that. Are you saved before you're baptized? Or are you saved after you're baptized? When are you in Christ? Well, Galatians 3 and verse 27 says, As many of you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. When do we put on Christ? In baptism, and not until. In Acts 2 and verse 38, they were told there to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. In Acts 22, verse 16, we see there that Saul, Paul, uh, the apostle later on, was told to ask why he tarried. Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins. Mark 16, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And 1 Peter 3, 21, we see there that baptism is a likeness, or is, is, a, is likened to the flood, wherein eight souls were saved through water or by water. The like figure where even to a baptism doth also now save us. Now that's ungetoverable, folks. Baptism's essential to your salvation. Romans 6, it's a likeness of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So you can't be saved without being baptized in water for the remission of your sins, which is where you reach the blood of Christ. And then after you do that, there are people who say, well, okay, I'll agree with that, but then I can do what I want to, right? No. Nope. You have to be faithful. Acts 2 and verse 47, they continued steadfastly. In the Apostles' doctrine, breaking of bread and prayer. We see there that the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. You can't keep the church out of your salvation. You can't have Jesus without the church. You can't have the head without the body. Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23, and Colossians 1, 18. Well, as a Christian, you're going to be expected to serve faithfully in the Lord's church until you die, and also you're expected to serve faithfully in your life until you die. Re Revelation 2.10, Be thou faithful unto death, and thou shalt receive the crown of life. I want to receive that crown, don't you? I hope we all do want to receive the crown of life that we have waiting for us, as Paul said, not just for him, but to all those who love his appearing. Our subject tonight, if you'll look at the charts here we have, is on the translations of the Bible. That is our subject for the rest of the evening, and we could draw your attention to that. This is a subject that is of concern to a lot of people. As we have grown in our society, we have had a number of different translations that are coming out. 
Some people, when they go to buy a Bible, they're absolutely confused as to which one should they get. Do you just shop the best price? What do you do? Is it okay to just read any Bible? Well, certainly there is some good in all Bibles that are out there because they have some truth in all of them. But what we want to strive for when we're going to see what translation of the Bible we're going to be uh, using, we need to make sure that we are following a translation and reading from a translation that as nearly as possible expresses what the Holy Spirit wanted us to know. And we have gotten into a situation today where we have wanted to kind of bring some of God's words down to our level. I know that, that time changes what people know and what they, how they speak, and I know that languages change. Translations are in so, so many different languages, and we'll talk about that tonight. By the year 900 A.D., there were 17 languages that the Bible had been translated into. And by the year 1400, the Bible had been translated into 28 different languages. So that tells us that, in, and today, there are multitudes of different languages that are out there and dialects that the Bible's translated into. Well, suppose you're not an American and you're out there and you're trying to see which, which translation you need to, need to have. There, there's a, a point to be made that the Latin, the languages that are more the Latin or Romance languages, there's a point to be made by some scholars that those are more close to the text because they have Latin base. Well, uh, English is not entirely Latin based, although it does have a great deal of Latin in it. But the Romance languages, Spanish and French and Italian and those, those types of languages, are languages that are drawn particularly from the Latin. And that tells us that they go back to a much deeper time than our English does. Because Latin was spoken, after was a spoken language after Greek was. And so that tells us that we need to make sure that we are trying to find out what we can as near as possible from the Scriptures, and that we are getting an accurate idea of what God wanted us to know. By the year 1800, following along with this, by the year 1800, there were 57 languages the Bible was translated into. By the year 1900, there were 537 languages. 537. Well, and then by the year 19, 1980, there were 1,800 different languages the Bible was translated into. And in the year 2000, there were 23 different, 2,300 different languages the Bible had been translated into. And so, again, we see there that all of these different languages are languages that men need to read in their own language so they can understand what God's will is for them. Will they bring differences in our language and how we, how we quote and what we do, what we know from God's Word? There will be differences in the language, but a translation is taken, in any language, is to be taken from the, an original text. And that's why it's important to look at the very front of your Bible. If you're holding a Bible tonight, there's a, there's a page on it that most people don't read. But it'll tell you a great deal about where your translation came from and about the particular translation you are reading from. It'll tell you some keys. Mine has keys to the pronunciation of proper names and all of those types of things. So there are all types of, of ideas out there about that. The Old Testament is a book of uh, the first five books are from Moses. Moses penned those. There's over 40 writers in the Scripture, and they wrote over a period of several hundred years. And by the year uh, 100 or so, the, the Bible was completed. 96 was when John uh, talked about the, and wrote the book of Revelation. So before the end of the first century, the Bible was already delivered to the saints. And we know that the 27 translation or 27 books of the New Testament were commonly used in 
the worship services of the New Testament Christians for several centuries. Now, if you have your Bible, turn to 2 Timothy 3 and verses 16 and 17. And this is an important passage because it says all Scripture is inspired of God. If it is something God wants us to know, He breathed it. And that word inspired, we've already talked about, is the idea of God breathing out the words that He wanted said to men, and they wrote them down. So, we see there that that is God speaking to man, God's utterances to man, and written down by man. As we look at the different translations that we have today and the different texts, ancient texts we have, uh, there are only 400 uh, variants, and that means different changes and variations in the scriptures overall in, 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 in the text that we read from. Uh, 400 or so of the 150 variants affect the sense of the passage, and 50 only 50 of all of those have any significance whatsoever. What that tells us is the language that the Bible was translated into was a language that was able to be understood by people, and that when we go back and, and talk about the original text, that is what was inspired. The original text that God gave to men. Now, translations, friends, are subject to the errors of men. So we'll point some of those out. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20 and 21, if any of us speak, let him speak as it were the oracles of God. An oracle was one who spoke a message. There is a message that God gives to us. And we know that the Word of God is described in Hebrews as a, a sword that is able to divide asunder between the bone and the marrow, we know Romans 1, verse 16, God announced that it is the Word of God that is powerful. It is the Word that is powerful. Now, notice the references to the Word all through the Scriptures of the New Testament. We know that it is the Word that leads someone to Christ. We read, whereby when you read, Paul said, you can understand. So again, read what? What are we supposed to be reading? Not the Old Testament, because that was nailed to the cross. But when we read the Scriptures, we can, we can pardon me, we can know what, how to please God. So that tells me that something is coming, or something's in process, or something is here, that I can read and understand. Paul, in talking to the Corinthians, he says, I'm writing you a letter. Well, what was he saying? He said, the things I say to one church, so I commend to all churches. So there was power in the words that were spoken, and you can read that throughout the New Testament. There was, a, there was an organized thought process that was given. Well, there are those today, and you might be one of them. We had a man call in last week, and he believed thoroughly that the King James Version, the 1611 edition of the King James, was the only translation that a person could look at and be absolutely convinced that that is the truth of God's Word. Well, the King James Version is a good translation. It comes from, it was taken from the original texts, and every attempt was made to keep it accurate. But it is not without its flaws. And I defy anybody that believes in the 1611 version, and that being the only one, to get a copy of a 1611 version. Go online and look at it if you'd like, and read it. You can't read it, because it's written in Old English. And Old English is not what we have today. The Bible also is made up of 66 different books that were written over a 1600-year period by 40 writers. There were 40 kings and prophets and leaders and followers of Jesus in the Scripture, from 1500 to 100. The Old Testament has 39 books written from uh, 1500 to 400. The New Testament has 21 that were written from about 45 to 100. And the Hebrew Bible has the same text as the English Bible's Old Testament. 
but divides it and arranges it differently. Now, remember that all the commas and all the periods and indeed all the verses and chapters, they were not that way. Those were things that man put in, divided it into chapters and verses, and that was man-made, and that ordered things that way. Again, as you look at the different ways in which the Bible is divided, man has done that to a large degree. So that tells us that, 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 that man uh, has altered some things because, again, if you have ever seen and if you have a, a, a computer, you can look at the Isaiah scroll taken from the Dead Sea Scrolls. I've seen the original in, in Israel. And it is written on one, basically one long sheet of paper from right to left. And it is written in Hebrew. And it's a, it's a language that you and I usually don't read. I couldn't read it if I wanted to. There are some people who can read, the, read that, but not me. So how do I know when I read the book of Isaiah that what is being said in the book of Isaiah in English is what, I, what it said in Hebrew? Well, I have to trust some people and I have to recognize that when somebody says that they took the original texts and they translated the language from that, there's a certain amount of faith I have to have that that was done. Now, not being able to read Hebrew, I've got to trust someone to tell me that it is according to the Hebrew text. Now, how do I do that? I verify as much as I can. And when I have a question, there is something we have called concordances that we can go and look up a number and we can see what the original word meant ourselves. We can't necessarily even pronounce the word. But like with us in English, when we don't know what a word means, what do we do? We go to the dictionary. Well, there are uh, lexicons and things such as that, that even a person that's unskilled in the language can go back and look at what the original word meant. And when you do that enough and you verify, when someone questions a passage about, is that really what God wanted to say? We go back and we look it up. Now, we, we may find that the translation we have in the English does not give the idea that the original author had in mind, God. And so what do we do? Who do we prefer? The language that we can understand or the language that God gave it in? Well, we go back to the original. That's what we do. And any time we're trying to prove a text, we go to what the text says. All right? For instance, there are differences in the different passages that was brought up by Roy as he called in. And he may be watching tonight. If you are, hi, Roy. We're trying to get in touch with you. and want to make sure we get the right phone number. So uh, if you give, a, give us a call, we'll be glad to get that right phone number. But he had a question about the Spirit, for instance, the other night. Well, he was talking about how Spirit means this and Ghost means this, and how it is a perversion of the Scripture by the Catholics, for instance, that they changed it from Ghost to Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit is called the Holy Spirit. He is also called the Holy Ghost. There is a whole argument to be made for ghost being more accurate than spirit, but ghost and spirit are synonymous terms. A spirit is the essence of someone. You can't be, uh, you, and he was making the point that the spirit of God has, uh, that God the Father has a spirit, that God the Son has a spirit, and God the Spirit has a spirit. Well, you can't be something and have something at the same time. If you are a spirit, you are a spirit. That's all you are. You're not a being with a spirit, you are a spirit. And so God is a spirit. He is essence. He is the epitome of essence. He doesn't have any beginning, doesn't have any end. He doesn't need any boundaries at all because He is forever. Okay? And all of deity is that way. Well, as we turn to Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 7, where Roy referred us to the, 12, uh, the seven spirits of God, the term seven, if you look through the book of Revelation, 
That term seven is a symbolic term that means a completeness or a wholeness or a uh, perfection. In numerology, and again the Bible does use numerology, particularly in the prophets of the Old Testament and also in the book of Revelation. Uh, I don't know that anybody can accurately count, I haven't ever been able to do it, the uses of the number seven in the book of Revelation. Just off the top of my head, I can't tell you how many times seven is used in the prophets and the Revelation. Well, what that tells us is it had a significant meaning. Seven, even today, we in our, in our society, seven is considered a lucky number, 11 a lucky number. And snake eyes is not considered something very good when you're rolling dice, which I don't suggest you do, but anyway. So we have numbers today that mean something. Three, the number three had significance. And it had the idea of a, perfe- of a completeness there. So, and the number six had a meaning. So when we see those things, our, 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 we must question, what does that mean? Are there literally seven spirits of God that are out there? No, there is a completeness of deity that is described in Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 7, where at the very beginning he's talking about the message is given to him by God, and it is, God is complete. There is a finality to the book of Revelation. And God is giving a complete message. He is the complete being. He is the epitome of perfection. And He is giving a message that is the same because God cannot and will not lie. So that's what that's talking about there. But the idea that, as was brought up last week, that seven spirits will be released upon the earth, once again, there is no biblical basis for that. There's nothing at all that, 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 that teaches that anywhere in the Scripture. And so that's what makes a question like that so hard, uh, so hard to answer because you, could, you consider that something needs to be a biblical question. And when you ask for the biblical basis of where twelve seven spirits of God are released upon the earth, you won't find that anywhere in the Scripture taught. You will find in Revelation chapter 1 that the kingdom is already here. We're not waiting for the kingdom to come. John is a partaker with them in chapter 1 of Revelation in the tribulation. So there is what is happening in the book of Revelation is a strong persecution that is coming on the people of God. And they're told to stand firm and stand tall and don't back up. God, who is perfect and complete, knows their worries, knows their concerns, and He's watching over them. And He is delivering a message of victory and encouragement to them at that time. So again, how do you know that? You study. And you compare Scripture with Scripture. The Bible is its best commentary. Did you know that? There's a lot of commentaries that are out there. I have several of them. But did you know that the Bible is the first source you go to for its own commentary? For instance, when you're wondering about what a word means, you go look up how many times that word is used. And then you go and see, is, there, is it used the same way every time? You know, For instance, the word wine in the Bible. And we look and see that wine in the Bible was used as oinos, which was a general term that could mean grape juice all the way to intoxicant. We know that yayin is used in the Old Testament primarily, and tirosh in Hebrew. And so those are used to refer to something that comes from the grape or from the vine. So again, we have to look at the context of the passage. First way we know what a Bible passage means is we look at the text. And we see what the, the text says. Then if we still have a misunderstanding, we go and see what the immediate context teaches. And then we go from there, if we're still a little foggy, we go to the broad context. The Old Testament was written mainly in Hebrew with some Aramaic. The New Testament was written in Greek. Now I've had a Greek class, but I'm a long way from being a Greek scholar. And uh, our professor told us in the Greek class, he said, a little Greek is a dangerous thing. He's right. So what we need to do is recognize that none of us are scholars in the original language that the Bible was delivered in and that it was written down in. And admit that. 
I am not a Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek scholar, and you are not either. Is it possible for people that don't speak a language that God delivered the Scriptures in to begin with? Is it possible for us to know the truth and the truth to set us free? Or was it just something reserved for those in the first century who could read the language that it was delivered in? Well, I believe God in His providence made a way for us all, all men everywhere. The gospel is to go out into all the world and it's the power of God into salvation. They went everywhere preaching what? The gospel or the truth? Then we can do the same thing today. Well, before the printing press was done, and it's hard for us to even imagine a time when there was not some way to print something automatically. We press a button on our computers and it gets sent in milliseconds to a printer. And that printer coughs out things and in just a few seconds you have a copy of something that you just came across. That's amazing. But to think of a time when people would take a pen, friends, would take a pen and they would write, and they would write ever so carefully and ever so, so accurately and they would write each word and they would make sure they would go back and test each syllable of that word to make sure that they were writing it and pinning it correctly. God was inspiring that, okay? And it was absolutely the mind of God inspired, men were inspired by God to pin those things. And God directed those things. Did you know that the Bible was the first book that was ever published on a printing press? The Gutenberg Press in 1455 produced the Latin version of the Bible. Now that was John Gutenberg that invented the printing press. It was at a time when the, the, God, the Bible had been pretty well reserved for the Catholic Church and for the elite people of the day. But others, others could own a copy, and there were those who were talked about as they were, their name was scribe, and what they would do is write down the text. That was their job. Now, by about A.D. 1500, thousands and thousands of the handwritten copies had been discovered. And we see there that there were 50, that today we have over 5,300 Greek manuscripts from the New Testament today. Now that's fragments of it and complete copies. And that is more copies, more ancient evidence for the Bible written copy than there is for the writings of Caesar, Plato, or Aristotle, or Shakespeare. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1949, or 48, over in Qumran, Israel, there's a young shepherd boy that was out walking around. And what he did was he was throwing rocks. And he threw a rock in a cave and a jar broke. And he went in to see what jar it was, whether it had some treasure in it of some kind. And he found several scrolls that were there. Upon, he went and go, told people what he had found, and they came and, and the shepherds came and, and got that. And they collected all of them, and they delivered them to some people, and they found out that they were complete copies. They were copies of the Scripture, scrolls of Scripture that had been undiscovered. Now, 1948 was a long time ago, but it wasn't as long ago as when these things were, were written and were penned. Did you know that when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered that there was no variation in any one of the, of the Scriptures that was out there? The Scriptures that existed until 1948 were verified to be true. The Dead Sea Scrolls produced nothing good. There were other things, or nothing new. There were other things that were discovered, other writings, other than the Scriptures. But the scriptures that were, that were retrieved, there was nothing new, there was nothing in error of anything that we had. Now friends, let me ask you this. How does that happen without the hand of God being involved somehow 
And again, I don't know all the details about how the Word was preserved except that God has a plan for salvation. God had a plan for all kinds of things. And if He wanted us to have a plan, if He had a plan, which I believe He did, for His Word being delivered to all mankind, I believe He could carry it out, don't you? And I believe He did. Did the people that were doing it know that what they were doing? I don't think so. Or the significance of what they were doing? Many of them were just writing copies, and they were paid to write those copies for somebody else. But those copies ended up being handwritten texts of the Scriptures. And again, there's more evidence for the Bible being God's Word. Now, by the year 2000, there were over 3,000 groups in the world that had no Bible in their language. Now, with that in mind, there are people right now that are working to get the Bible translated into those languages. Because the Bible needs to be translated. Now, by languages, we're talking in some cases dialects too. Now, Portuguese, for instance, is a very different type of language. It's a very specific language. But it has, it has Latin roots and it has Spanish roots. So a person, although there may not be, and there, by the way, there is a Portuguese Bible, but I'm using that as an example. Although there might not be a dialect, every dialect of Spanish, there is Spanish. So a person can read a text. Although the Baltic states have several different Slavic type of languages and Germanic languages, there is still a central language that most everybody speaks that there's a Bible in translated into. The Bible, or some of the Bible, was translated into seven languages by A.D. 500, 13 by 900, 17 by 1400. You see, we went through this about how, how language kept changing and people had different languages. Now that goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel, that people were, had different languages in different areas. So God knew about language. And he knew that people needed to be able to understand in their own language. Okay? Now, on the day of Pentecost, you remember when the tongues were part of, the, of, of what the gifts were at that time, nine different gifts? And the apostles, the people that were there, were marveling that each of them understood in their own language. Now, that was before it was written down. So the gift of tongues was for a period of time so that people could understand in their own language or tongue. Those were known languages, by the way. It wasn't gibberish. And so people understood in their own language. And that tells us that we ought to make sure that people can understand what God wants in their own language. That's why when we go overseas and we preach and we teach to people, and they, are, they don't speak the language, that we have an interpreter who interprets what we're saying from God's Word into their language so they can hear the beautiful message of the Gospel. When we read a text, we're reading from the Scriptures, and the person's translating into the different language. And that's a beautiful thing. God has so fashioned the Bible and the language that He delivered it into to start with is of such a nature that it can be translated into any number of different languages in the world, but yet have the same meaning to everybody that reads it. That's remarkable, friends. That's remarkable. And God meant it to be that way, and God delivered it that way, just like he, everything He made was good. Well, when He wrote the Scriptures, when He delivered the Scriptures to men to pen and to write, he, wanted, he, he made sure that that was his language. You remember in the Old Testament when the king uh, didn't like what he was reading? And so he threw it in the fire. It's a scroll of Jeremiah. He threw it in the, in the fire. And you know what happened? The scribe wrote another copy. Okay? So you can't destroy the text of the Bible. It is going to last. And it can be understood and you can um, rely on it. All right, in Revelation chapter 5 and verses 8 and 9, we see there that uh, Jesus, or the, the one who sat on the white throne, is the only one 
that could be found that could open the seal of the book. Well, friends, all of us today, and that's, symb that's symbolic language, by the way, but all of us today have been given the capacity to read and to understand what the Bible is. How did we get the Bible, friends? Have you ever wondered about that? Did we just, did somebody just find a copy of it one day and said, okay, I guess it's a Bible? Or was there a plan? Was there a plan God had in mind? Let's follow on some charts here for just a moment. How did we get the Bible? That's a good question. How did we get the Bible? That may be a question you've had on your mind. Maybe it's something that's bothering your faith. Can you rely on this book? Can you depend on it? And if so, how do you depend on it? How do we come to get this? Where did it come from? Well, there's a song by Isaac Watts in 1724, Must I carry, be carried to the sky on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas. We've got a life to live, friends. Are we soldiers of the cross? Are we able to know and stand for the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ as a true story? Can we hold to that? Can we hold to the unchanging hand of God and His message to us? Well, look, if you will, at the translations that we have today in the Scriptures. The first translation or, of the Bible was into Syriac about the year 200. And then from there we see here is, the, here is an early translation that we have today of the Syriac version. This is a copy on, the, on a picture of what we have. So this dates from the second and third centuries. The Bible was translated into Syriac, and Syriac is a dialect of Aramaic, and it was used in the region of Antioch. Okay, So we have a Syriac translation of the Bible from the second and third centuries. Okay, That's just a hundred years, within a hundred years of when John the Apostle was still alive walking around. Okay, Maybe less than that. It was the most, the most widely accepted version of the Syriac was called the Peshitta, and it meant pure. Pure means something that is absolutely holy. And so we see from the Syriac, we came to the Coptic translation of the Bible. Someone says, do we have that? Yes, we do. We have a, cop we have a copy of that. In the second and third centuries, the Bible was translated into Coptic, which is a form of Egyptian in use at the time. So there we have a, a complete text of the Coptic version from, dating again from the second and third centuries. Now someone says, well that's still a little way. We don't have an original handwritten copy of the Bible by God. No, they didn't have an original handwritten copy of the Ten Commandments. They, they messed up. Moses broke them. And so Moses wrote the other one, so we're going to have to trust that Moses wrote down what God had in mind, aren't we? When Jesus took the, took the scroll of the law and read it in the tabernacle, and then put it down and walked away and read prophecies, where did He get those? Those scrolls had been copied, and Jesus read from them. And He talks about, have you not read? Have you not read? Now, if Jesus said that there's something was be, yet they could go read it, then don't you think that they knew they had something to read and that Jesus knew that what they would read would lead them to truth? Again, it's implied throughout Scripture that the written Word was there. Jesus read from the written Word, and we can do the same today. Again, it had to be copied by men. But God did not allow His Word to come down without having some type of understanding that it was what He wanted delivered. The Greek alphabet was adopted a few years uh, after the Coptic version was translated, and it was under the influence of Bible translators. The Gothic Bible, which dates from about the, two th or the 300s, um, was the next version or the next translation of the Bible that we have. About 350, 
the Wolf, the, the Wolfillas began to translate portions of the Bible into a language that was Gothic in nature, the language of the Goths. And that would be the po folks, if you look back at the, at the map, that would be the folks up in the um, Baltic regions of the world. So the Gothic translation of the Bible was around. They, in, they had to invent an alphabet for Gothic in order to even make a translation. The Gothic language did not have an organized alphabet until the translation of the Scripture. Well, someone looks at that and they say, wow, that's, that's interesting. So again, look again in, the, in about the year 200. In the 200s, there was the Latin version of the Bible that came out, Latin translation. The century, in the second, third century, the Bible was translated into Latin and it rapidly grew, Latin rapidly grew to be the language of the Roman Empire, replacing Greek. So again, copies from the second and third centuries were out there for people to read and to understand. And notice here, we've got four different translations that were around in the second and third centuries. Did you know that we don't have any other book, no other book that we know of today has that ancient a dating that we can look back and see records and fragments and uh, actual full copies of the scripture. Isn't that interesting? No other book that we know of has that. Well, so in the second and third century, the Bible was translated into Latin and then we see that in the 400s, it was translated into Armenian, into the Armenian language. In the 5th century, Mesrop invented alphabets for the, Arame uh, for the Aramean and the Georgians in order to translate the Bible into those languages. Again, people are wanting the Bible in their own language. They want to read and understand it. And so they are taking texts and translating it. Now, what are they translating it from? Again, let's go back to our charts and look at all of these going all the way back to the very first one in the Syriac version. Where did the Syriac, where did the Syriac version come from? It, it was a translation of something that already existed. Okay? The Coptic, the Gothic, and so on. They were translations all the way down into the Latin right now. Well, after the Latin Bible, we have the Armenian Bible, and then we have after that, we have the Ethiopic Bible, one that would have been African in nature, and a, a language, Ethiopian, that would have been able to be read. Translated into Ethiopic or Gies. Jews had been in Ethiopia for some time. You go back to Acts 8 and you see the first one that we see that was converted. He was a, he was a proselyte Jew. And he went back and people wanted to read. Remember he had a copy of the, of the uh, scroll of Isaiah? He was reading chapter, 20, chapter 53. That's in Acts 8. Where did he get a copy? Well, it was common to have one, wasn't it? People could have those copies. The Old Testament was translated into Ethiopic well before the fourth century. And then we have after that the Slavonic language in the 800s that took place. In the, 1800, in the 800s, Cyril and Methodius, two brothers, taught among the Slavic people, and to translate the Bible, they had to invent again an alphabet for their language, which is now called the Old Church Slavonic language. Again, now we have more and more translations of the Bible. Russian is written in the Cyrillic alphabet. So again, all the Russian people or the people in the Slavic area were able to read and understand. The people in the Roman Empire were able to read the Latin and understand the Scripture and the Gospel was being spread and the seed was being sown. Remember in Mark 16, 15, we're told to go into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. And he that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not will believe will be condemned. Now friends, we're supposed to go into all the world and preach the gospel to who? To everybody. To everybody. How shall they hear? Look at Romans 10 and verse 14. You remember that whole point? How shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? Well, how shall they believe in Him whom they have not even heard? 
And how shall they hear without a preacher? And where does the preacher get his texts? How does the preacher get what he's supposed to be preaching? He's held to charge in Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, to preach the whole the counsel of God. He can't preach anything else. He can't even preach what he wants, what some angel delivers to him if that were to happen. He's to preach the gospel of Christ. There is a formulated gospel that is to be preached in its purity and its simplicity. And Peter talks about those that would pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul talks about them in Acts chapter 20. He talks about the very uh, elders at Ephesus that would pervert the gospel. In Galatians 1.6, they are removing from the truth that Paul taught them. And he's amazed at that. How do we hold to a standard if we have no standard? How do we hold to a truth if we don't know what truth is? They knew what truth was. They had the gifts at the beginning, and they had the written words as time went on, and we have that today. Someone says, well, do, wouldn't it be better if we had all the, the tongues and stuff? No, because to have the tongues, you had to have the interpreter of the tongues. Again, what was the purpose of the interpreter? So that the person could understand. And if you did not have an interpreter, you were to be quiet. Okay. So that interpreter was equal to what a translator would be later on. The gift of, in, of tongues would cease, 1 Corinthians 13. And prophecies would cease, but there was a written message that would continue. In Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 8, there's something interesting the Bible reveals here, and that is they read distinctly. Ezra and the others that were, that were doing this they read distinctly from the book of the law of God. And notice this, they gave the sense of it and they helped them to understand. So they didn't just read something, but they were reading something, weren't they? They brought out the book of the law and they read it to the people and they gave the sense and the meaning of the scripture. That means they preached. They looked at the text and they preached the text. Friends, that's what we are to do today. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 10 that we are to do. How shall they hear without a preacher? Jesus was proclaimed throughout the scripture without a cell phone. He was proclaimed without the internet. He was proclaimed without computers. He was proclaimed without a printing press, without airplanes, without automobiles, and so on. So again, before the Latin Vulgate came along, people knew the Scriptures. Jesus was proclaimed, and people were obedient to the message that they heard. What's God doing? He's delivering His Word to men. Hebrews 11, or Hebrews chapter 1, God who in sundry times and in divers manners spoke in times past, as Hebrews 1, Unto the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us through His Son. Who did His Son send? He sent the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, who would guide them, watch this, into all truth. Guide who? The apostles. And the writers of the New Testament would be guided into all truth. What kind of truth? All truth. So the Spirit would guide them into all the truth. Can we know what that truth says? Well, the Scriptures themselves says, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. There was a man named Jerome that lived in from about 342 to 420. He was about 90 when he died. And he was trained as a boy in the Greek and the Latin classics, and in the grammar of the Greek. He studied Hebrew in a cave for a long time. Again, it takes a certain type of person to do this. I'm not geared this way. I would probably not be chosen at all to do something like this. But there were people, a lot of them, during this time who gave themselves over to language. I like language. I, the, there's a man I know in Texas that speaks eight different languages. He speaks six of them fluently. 
Well, he knows types of different ideas about language. He has made a study of language. He likes language. I'm not geared that way. There is a translator you can get on your computer that is much easier to use than uh, going and sitting in a cave and translating something. But Jerome was a, was a young man. Remember that he spent his life in the Greek and the Latin classics and in grammar and studied Hebrew for some time. And he found the Latin Bible texts of his day to be what he thought was coarse. In other words, that it had taken the dignity of Scripture and kind of brought it down to a level that he didn't feel like was appropriate. To him, it did not give the high sense or the high meaning of, and the, of the Scripture. In Constantinople, he served as the secretary to Pope Damasus. Now again, Jerome was uh, involved in the, some of the first digressions of the church. The Catholic Church was not fully developed at this time. Um, not totally, but there were Pope people running around using the name Pope. But the first official Pope was in 606. But there were people calling themselves Papas of different regions. And there was no universal Pope until 606. But Damasus assigned him the work to work on a new Latin translation. And commenting on this, on the confusing state of the Latin Bible, Jerome is recorded. Again, he not only read, he wrote, he was a historian. He says, there is almost as many forms of the text as there are copies. Now what that says is he was worried about the purity of the text. Commenting on the Old Testament, he says they were like the crazy wanderings on the apocryphal books, by the way. This tells us something about uh, the 14 books in the Catholic Bible that are apocryphal. They're historical, but he says they are the crazy wanderings of a man whose senses have been taken leave of. He did not believe that the apocryphal books belonged in the exact text. And he was concerned about getting the text right. So he traveled to Palestine and he compared different manuscripts. And Jerome, with others, prepared, prepared the first Latin translation of the Bible in 405. Well, the Latin Vulgate is what it's called, and the word Vulgate, it comes from the word vulgar, which does not mean what it means now, it meant common, okay? It's written in the vulgar, or the Vulgate, and it was common, Latin, so that the common man could understand it. That's the in, in idea of the Vulgate, the Latin of the common man. The Latin that can be understood readily by anyone today. Again, it came to be recognized as the authorized version of Western Europe and stayed that way for about a thousand years. So the Latin Vulgate was highly respected. Well, let's look at, the, look at some of our charts now as we go through this. Go back to the charts, please. Well, the Latin Vulgate was a translation. It was not an original. But the original biblical texts were in Hebrew and Latin, and Jerome had taken the Latin Vulgate from those languages. And again, the Latin Vulgate was intended for the common man. Remember that? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? It represented excellent scholarship, but it was not flawless because it was a translation of an original text. Well. Is it possible for men to do something and put something down wrong? It is, but not in the original text or the original language. In 1 Thessalonians 5.21, we are admonished here, and God foresaw that we were to test all things. He understood that men could make mistakes and that we need to test all things and hold fast to what's good. Friends, how, many, how much confusion has there been in the religious world over the very term baptism? How can I prove that baptism is an immersion? The first place I go is to the language, baptizo in the Greek, and what does it mean? It means to dip, to plunge, to put beneath, and to overwhelm. Well, I tell you what, that's not sprinkling and that's not pouring. But men got confused. So if I'm wondering whether my sprinkling baptism was adequate enough for God, all I need to do is look at the word baptizo 
and go look it up in the original. That's the original intent of God, that you be baptized, not sprinkled, not poured, but immersed in water. The action is also given in Acts chapter 8 when they went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and came up out of the water. Okay. Romans 6 talks about it as being a likeness of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Hold fast to what's good. I can test all things. I can go and look. 1 Thessalonians 5.21. I don't have to have somebody help me do that. I can go do that. And friends, it doesn't take long to understand how to use a concordance and how to understand how to use a lexicon. So all we have to do is just go look up the original intent of the, of the author, God. Now, the possibility of apostasy is talked about. The time will come, Paul told Timothy, when some will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth, and they'll be turned aside to fables. All right, now how do I test that? How do I know what's a fable and what's the truth? Is it testable? Can I, can I prove it? Yes, I can, because I have a text of Scripture that has a great history of being accurate. And so I want to make sure that my translation is where I need to, what it needs to be. Now it's right to make certain that copies of texts are accurate, friends. It is right to make certain that translations are accurate. And quite frankly, folks, there have been a lot of people that have been involved in some of the translations that are out there today that are just not, the, the translation is, fiction. It's not what the text of the Scripture means. It's what people have written about it, but it's not what the Scripture means. It is right also to reflect on what God's Word says and to want to have the pure truth. Again, when you have someone who is making inaccurate translations, they are making the Bible be doubted, and so there's a lack of trust and the inspiration of God. And there are those who are become skeptical and would try to demean the Word of God. Now in the days of Josiah, remember this, the book of the law was lost and it was brought out. Well, let's look at the Middle Ages for just a moment. This is when only the wealthy could afford a Bible. That's hard for us to understand, isn't it? While people today will give you a Bible, if you want one, you just let it be known and they'll give you one. So only the wealthy at this time in the Middle Ages could afford Bibles. All copies were made by a scribe. They were made by hand. Remember, this is before the printing press. So a person actually sat down and wrote you a copy of the text. Wow. You had to really want a Bible, didn't you? And they were a little expensive for the day. And they were cherished by people. Well, the common man was not encouraged to read the Bible. The Catholic Church was very much in charge right at, through this time period, and although they were persecuting people for translating the Bible, and they were persecuting people for even reading a copy or owning a copy of their own Bible, even though that was being done, there was a sense in which God's providence was preserving the Word through the persecution of the Catholic Church as they sought to, to, to get every type of copy they could of the texts and own them themselves and put them into their treasury as valued heirlooms. Well, Bibles were so expensive that they were chained to pulpits. The Roman Catholic Church was very dominant in Western Europe about this time, and the first Bible Luther ever saw was one changed to a library uh, pulpit. The Bible in many ways was chained in the minds of men too, because men at this time began to develop what many people have today, and that is the clergy concept. And that is the Catholic Church was able to let the people uh, to convince the people that the Bible was so difficult that it could only be understood 
through the translations in the mind of a person directly led by God to do so, and they called them their priests. And so the person, the regular everyday common man, just thought, well, I don't understand, I can't understand such a magnificent book and such a cherished book, but the church can, and they will tell me what it means, and then I'll have to go by what they say. God never intended for that to be the case. He wanted all men everywhere to come to repentance and to be able to read and understand the Scripture. Preaching in Latin, our preaching was in Latin in the Catholic Church at that time, and that was true up into the late 1800s, early 1900s, even in this country. Uh, later than that with some friends I know that they went, would go to church and have no idea what was said because they didn't speak Latin. But Latin became a dead language, and so it, it became very unpopular. But Latin had become the language of the, of the, or the European scholars of the day. And so we see the Latin Vulgate was the only accepted Bible in the, in the Catholic Church in all of Western Europe and remained that way for many, many, many years. The common people, however, that didn't speak Latin were ignorant of God's Word. So here we see a language becoming extinct a language that once was the language of the people, the Latin Vulgate, and now it is a language that has gotten out of line. Well, could you still be able to prove from the Latin Vulgate what the Word of God was? Yeah, because it's taken from some original texts. But you'd have to have people tested. And that's the beauty of God's Word in translations. Although it's translated into a language, that language from into which it's translated can be tested to see. Now, do words change over time? They do. They do. And we're going to talk about some of those changes as we go on. So the Bible was, uh, the, the time of the Middle Ages was aptly appro appropriately called the Dark Ages. And that's when uh, knowledge was only reserved for just a few people. And uh, governments thrived on the ignorance of the everyday person and a whole system of elite politicians, of elite rulers, many of them um, religious officials who were on the take, developed during that time. And you were put on the, the idea was sold to the people that if you go against any priest or anyone associated with the Catholic Church, you will die. Again, horrible way to rule. In Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, Hosea observed at a much different time, he says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, God says, I will reject you from being priests for me because you have forgotten the law of your God. I also will forget your children. So they had forgotten the law. How'd they know the law? Well, Hosea, during the time of Hosea, they knew what the law was. In Matthew 23 and verse 13, Jesus says to the Pharisees, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You neither go in yourself, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. So you see how the Catholic Church adopted some of the same practices as the Pharisaical Jews at that time, where they wanted this elite class of religious ruler that would they be able to intimidate the people into thinking that they were too ignorant to understand anything God had to say to them. God wanted the gospel to be unreigned, to be free to all men. And we're going to see how that takes place in history. Again, we're talking about providence. Providence is how God provides for His plan without taking over man's free will, but uses what man does, good or bad, to accomplish his purposes. And we're going to talk about what the Catholic Church was trying to do, that they actually hid a copy and it was being rolled up for, for a firewood and to warm the, warm the building, and it was a copy of the, an original copy of Scripture. And it is one of the greatest finds that, they ever, that, that it ever has ever been found in textual criticism. 
Well, a period after the Dark Ages came about, after a period of a pretty sad period in the history of Western Europe. And the Renaissance and the Reformation came about. The printing press was, uh, came into being. Christian humanism, in other words, not humanism as we look at it today, but that every Christian has a right to know what's right. And then the Protestant Reformation came about during this, after the period of the Dark Ages. Paper making took place. Now, the, the type of product in the Old Testament that was used was papyrus and also um, parchments that were made. Well, the parchment was something that was along the line of an animal skin, and the, the papyrus was a, was a grain type of, type of paper writing on. And uh, then we know that they wrote some of the scrolls on rocks and on other things that were there. But paper making started taking place, and although paper making was invented in China in 105 AD, it didn't make its way to Europe until 950 AD. So, paper, a paper mill in Europe was set up, and one was set up also in Spain about the year 1150. So now we got paper, and this made book making easier and cheaper, and so it made Bibles more common. The printing press was made in 1452 by John Gutenberg, and he succeeded in printing the first uh, press with movable type. Again, a magnificent invention that we need to thank him for even today. Uh, you and I have been have gone through. I mean, in my generation, I've gone through typewriters, non-electric, all the way through through the different generations of typewriters. I've gone from mimeographs to uh, to copy uh, copy machines and printers today. We have laser printers, we have ink printers, and all of that comes as a, as a many generations removed from what John Gutenberg made. The first printed publication was a papal indulgence, granting forgiveness of sins to the bearer. Now, again, the sale of indulgences is not a good hit part of the Catholic history. They literally sold permission to sin if a person wanted to do that. And that's how they built the magnificent uh, structures at Vatican City, particularly St. Peter's Cathedral. They sold permission to sin to the people. And it was forgiveness without going to confession. And you could buy it to the highest bidder and you had a maximum that you could buy, but you could buy indulgences up to a certain point, all you wanted of them. And that would give you a license and you would be automatically forgiven of your sins if you bought this indulgence. Well, Gutenberg printed up those things, those indulgences. There was a book that was put out called the 42-Line Bible. In 1457, he printed the 42-Line Bible, Gutenberg did. And it was a printed edition of the Latin Vulgate named for its 40, 42 lines pages. It wasn't only 42 lines total, but each page had 42 lines. Well, that's an orderly arrangement, isn't it? Now, was that something that God ordained? Yeah. No, it's something that man put in that made it. Again, he didn't take words out. He just rearranged them so that on printed material, it would look orderly much like we have a button that we push on our typewriters or our keyboards now for margins where we can just go up and adjust the margin any way we want to for the document that we're putting out. That's what Gutenberg did, the 42-line Bible. Now, typesetters took an entire day to lay out one page. There was very great care given to it, wasn't there? Wanted to make sure the type was set perfectly. Well, Christian humanism developed from the 14th to the 16th century. It's a movement that came across Europe known as humanism. Now, the humanism that exists today is very, very much uh, a horrible situation. The Humanist Manifesto 1 and 2, you can read copies of those, and it is uh, not what you would want to read, and it's not something that you ought to be proud of that people are pursuing today. 
Unlike modern humanism that sees man as the sum of all things, Christian humanism fostered an appreciation for what man can do with the abilities God gave them. It, is, it was the argument that we are human, but we come from God. And God is the one who dictates to us the best way to live. It was a very wholesome doctrine at that time, but it later has, and to today it is, it is digressed to a horrible communistic socialist idea. But the movement in, this, in the time of the Renaissance uh, led to an appreciation of classical learning and texts and a, a revering of those texts and a strong desire to look back to the original sources. If you'll go up to the Biltmore, this is something you can go look at. If you go up to the Biltmore and look at the library of Mr. Vanderbilt, you'll see the value that he placed on the written word. Now, he was much removed time-wise from the Renaissance. But you, have you ever heard the idea of a Renaissance man? They appreciated the, the cultural, the, the language, the, the classics uh, writings. And he would develop, he would cherish those books. There was a time when books were very much cherished. Any kind of book was cherished. But the Holy Bible, the Bible was the most cherished and continues to be of all books there are out there. There was a man named Erasmus who read the work of a man named Walla uh, entitled The Annotation on the English New Testament. Walla sought to look back to the original language of the Scripture to make sure that that was something that was right, and then he found out that it wasn't. He had false concepts that had been risen over time. He found that in this annotation on the New Testament, and he disproved it by going back to the original language. And so it, the, the annotation of the New Testament pretty well just went away. There are a few copies still around, but it pretty much went away. Erasmus was intrigued and set himself up in the task of comparing Greek to the, ink, or to the versions that he was reading in Latin. And Erasmus published the first critical edition of the Greek New Testament with the Vulgate in a parallel column. So he printed the Vulgate out there right along with the language that he was using. In 1558, he replaced the Vulgate with his own translation. And Erasmus says this in 1560 edition of the Greek New Testament. He says, I wish that the scriptures might be translated into all languages so that not only the Scot and the Irish, but also the Turk and the Saracen can read and understand both of them. Then I long that the farm laborer may sing, them, sing the praises of the scripture as they walk along behind the plow, that the weaver will be able to tune his shuttle, and the traveler will beguile the, weir will the weariness of a journey with the beautiful messages of the Bible." So what he's saying here is, I want to get the Bible in the hands of the common folk. Now these were, these were heretical views at that time, to get the Bible into the hands of the people. Now, a man named Stephanus published a revision in Geneva of Erasmus's text, and making use of more manuscripts, he says, than Erasmus did. But there were very few variations, but there were a few. It was Stephanus who set up the chapter and verse divisions that we have even today. Now again, this was about the year 1550. You wouldn't call out such and such a chapter and such and such a verse. You had a book, chapter, and verse. We talk about that today. What's the book, the chapter, and the verse? Well, Stephanus is the one that separated the Bible into chapters and into verses that we have today. And his, his uh, text that he translated from several different original texts came to be known as the Textus Receptus, or the text that is received by all. And so the Textus Receptus was a very common and very good translation of the Bible. When the Protestant Reformation came along in 1517, a German monk named Martin Luther challenged the Catholic Church's practice of indulgence selling. It disturbed him greatly that that was being done, and rightly so. 
Although originally interested in only reforming Catholicism, Luther's ideas spawned a movement throughout Europe that rejected the authority of the Roman bishop and said, we need to go to the text of the Scripture. Well, you couldn't go to that because the, all, the, all the languages were done. Uh, only on the sly were you able to do these things. And when the printing press came along, it made it more able, you made a person more able to get different versions of the Bible. Well, a motto on the Reformation was solo scriptura. In other words, the scriptures alone. Absent from any man, the scriptures alone. In 1522, using Erasmus's Greek New Testament, Luther made the first translation of the New Testament in German from the original Greek. So he took the original Greek texts and translated the scripture into German. This became the book of many Protestants and fueled the desire of their reformers to possess the Bible in their own language. Again, the printing press made it very able to be done. Martin Luther, in commenting on the Bible, says this, there's no clearer book that has ever been written in this wide world than the Holy Scriptures. Compared with all other books, it's like the sun over all other lights. He went on to say, don't let them lead you out of it and away from it, much as they may try to do. For if you step out, you are lost. They take you out wherever they wish. If you remain within, you will be victorious. If you remain within the Scripture, is what he said. Don't let them take you out of the Scripture. So that, what Luther was doing, is he was saying to the common person, you don't listen to what a preacher says or a priest says, you go to the text yourself. And don't you let them take you out of it. And friends, to that, although Luther and I would agree, disagree on a lot of things, I would say amen to Mr. Luther on that. We don't need to let anyone take us out of the Scriptures. This whole program is called The Word and the Sword. We, our case for what we do spiritually has to come from the text. If it does not, it is not truthful. And we can know, and God made, it, made us able to search the Scriptures, for in them ye have life. The Bible is sufficient, friends, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. The gospel, all scripture given by inspiration, it's profitable. Watch this for doctrine. That's that's our that's what the things we need to believe. To reprove us, in other words, so that we can change our ways, for correction, so that if we're walking a wrong way, we turn and walk the other way, for instruction in righteousness. Why? So that the man of God might be perfect, and furnished completely unto every good work. Now, all scriptures inspire to God. Prove all things and hold fast to what's good. In 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul says to Timothy, I know this about you, Timothy, that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures. How did he learn them? His mother and his grandmother taught them to him. And they are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith that is in Christ Jesus. Man does not need anything, folks. You don't need a priest to interpret the Bible for you. You don't need a preacher to tell you what you have to believe. And you don't need a council to define what the truth is. Methodist Church, by the way, I heard this past week, and some of you have followed this in the news as I have. They're dividing right now and it's awful when anybody divides, but they're dividing over the subject of homosexuality. The scriptures are firm about what, what the position should be on that. But men are caving, and they're leading people to cave. Now, man does not need any additional revelation. Up in this area, there have been many of you who may be watching tonight, and you've called in and you said, God talked to me in a, in a voice that nobody else even heard. Well, no, you don't need that. What would God say to you? What would the Holy Spirit say to you or do for you that the Word of God does not accomplish in you when applied? We have the Word today. 
and we can all do the same things. We don't need someone great, that's a great intellectual to comprehend the scriptures for us. We can understand it. Now, are there some things hard to understand? Peter said there was. And remember that the eunuch said, how can I accept some man guide me? Guidance is one thing, but guidance in what? Guidance in the scripture. The preacher doesn't have the right to guide you into what he thinks. He has the right to guide you into the scriptures. He doesn't have the right to take off and just go in tangents and tell you what you ought to do with no scriptural basis for it whatsoever. You reject that. And you come out of churches that do that type of thing. God knows how to talk. He knows how to speak. And He has told us what He wants us to know. The God that made the universe and six, uh, the, everything that's in the world and the universe in six days, don't you think He knows how to deliver a text to us so that we can read it and understand it? Now, we understand things when we read. In Eph Ephesians 3, 4, this is scriptural. When you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. What were the Ephesians supposed to read? They're supposed to read what was written. Okay? Things that are read are things that are written. Well, translating the Bible into English, the beginnings of the English Bible are interesting. About 735, a man named Beatty translated the Gospel of John into Anglo-Saxon, which is an ancient form of English, much like the Old English that we're talking about. In the 800s, King Alfred distributed Exodus, Psalms, and Acts to the people of, Anglo of the Anglo-Saxon uh, heritage. There were no manuscripts of these works that have survived yet today. There have been copies that have been presented, and we have a fair representation of what it was like. But there have, up to this point, haven't been many of those that have survived. Well. The Lindisfarne Gospels that came out in 950, a priest named Aldred wrote an Anglo-Saxon translation above the Latin text of an older manuscript of the Gospels. And again, the Wycliffe Bible came from that. John Wycliffe led a group of priests who believed that preaching should be done in the language of the people and not in Latin, and boy, that was heretical. And he died about the year 1385. But anyway, uh, he said they, he called these people that were uh, teaching only in Latin lollards, meaning mutterers. In other words, they were talking to people and the people had no idea what they were saying. Now, <clears throat> there were people in our country, in the Catholic Church, that protested the Latin uh, worship. And so, most of the Catholic Church today engages itself in a Latin assembly and also in an English assembly. Well, Wycliffe died about the uh, 1300s, and one of his followers, John Purvey, published the first entire translation of the Bible into English from Latin in 1408. It was outlawed. He, I'm sorry, he wrote it in 1395, and it was outlawed in 1408. Now, why was it outlawed? Interesting point. In 1428, Pope Martin V ordered Wycliffe's body to be exhumed and burned and the ashes scattered in a stream near his house. Why? Because the control was coming away from the Catholic Church. And these Bibles were going off, I mean, the Wycliffe Bible was a very, very accurate translation of Scripture. Now, <clears throat> now came the leaders, because the Catholic Church engaged the leaders of Europe to stand up and, make, and, and push their weight around a little bit. Henry VIII authorized the Tyndale Bible in 1526. The Tyndall Bible was done by a man named William Tyndall, who came to Cambridge shortly after Erasmus left. He was very interested in Erasmus's writings and became skilled in Greek and in Hebrew. And in response to laws forbidding the translation of the Bible into English, Tyndale went to Germany, where he translated the New Testament into English from the Greek. Again, he started off as an agent of Henry VIII. And then he quickly 
protested and went out. Tyndale said this, If God spares my life, ere many years pass, I will cause a boy that drives a plow that he will know more of the scriptures than I do. What's he saying? I want to get the Bible into the hands of the people. Think God has anything to do with that, folks? I do. I sure do. Well, the Tyndale New Testament was published in 1526, smuggled into England, and the officials burned every copy they could find of it. Burning Bibles. Why would you burn a Bible? Again, it bothered the politics. It bothered the hierarchy of organized religion. In 1536, Tyndale was arrested, he was strangled, and he was burned at the stake. His dying words were, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. Henry VIII finally found him and killed him. The Tyndale Bible introduced many words into English for which he could find no existing word. Again, Tyndale was looking for a word that had something to do with endurance. The idea of going on and on and, and just putting yourself to the test over and over and over. And he came up with a hyphenated word, long suffering. Again, very accurate idea of what God is with us. He suffers long with us. The Tyndale Bible was more literal in some passages than some versions that followed it. So again, it's a very accurate translation. 1 Timothy chapter 3.15 in the Tyndale Bible says, But in if I tarry longer, that then thou mayest yet have knowledge how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the hosts of God, which is the congregation of the living God, the pillar and ground of trueth. Again, look at the language. That's English, folks, but boy, it's hard to, <laughs> hard to even read it, you know. Now, what do we, how do we have it today? If I tarry long, that thou mayest know how to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Very accurate translation, isn't it, that we have today? Well, the Coverdale Bible came out in 1535 and Matthew's Bible in 1537. The Coverdale Bible, Miles Coverdale, worked in Germany with Tyndale and supported Luther's reforms, and in 1535 published the, the complete translation of the entire Bible into English, both Old and New Testament. Now, he used Latin and Greek texts for the Old Testament. He didn't go back to the original part. Now, the Matthews Bible, uh, a friend of Tyndale's in 1537, uh, John Rogers published another complete Bible making use of Tyndale's uh, notes, and Rogers gave credit for the work that he did to Thomas Matthews, but he is believed to have done the, most of the translations himself. Now, that, from that came the Great Bible in, in 1539. And look, if you will, at what the Great Bible is. In 1537, Coverdale was commissioned by, Oliver Crom by Thomas Cromwell, Oliver's brother, the Chancellor of England, to revise the Matthews Bible. And the Great Bible was published in 1539 with the sanction now of Henry VIII, and it, and it used the original text of the Hebrew <coughs> for the Old Testament. Well, Cromwell and Cranmer uh, did a great deal to move the leaders toward the allowing of an English Bible in the common person's mind. And again, in 1540, this man, Cromwell, and his friend, Cranmer, even though commissioned by Henry VIII to do this, Henry VIII killed them. Now, why would you kill somebody for printing a Bible? Why would you do that? Well, in 1546, in response to the rise of the Protestant movement, the Council of the Catholic Theologians declared that the Vulgate was the sole authoritative text in matters of faith and morals. The Clementine Vulgate, 
The council didn't acknowledge that the Vulgate was not without imperfections, and so they wanted a revision of it and correction, the corrected version. So the final council commissioned Pope Chancellor VIII in Clementon Vulgate in 1552. And so enters the period of Mary I, as she was called Bloody Mary. She was a strict Catholic. She was Mary Tudor, and she persecuted the Puritans and other Protestants who had copies of the Bible. Public readings of the Bible in England were outlawed by her, and translators of the Matthew Bible were burned at the stake, Rogers and Matthews. Miles Coverdale escaped with his life and never showed up in England again, and he came, kind of went underground. There's a Bible called the Geneva Bible, and by the way, if you want to go to Eureka Springs, Arkansas, they have a museum of ancient Bible texts, English Bible texts, and you can see some of these Bibles there, actual Bibles that I'm talking about. When Mary I came to the throne in 1553 and sought to reaffirm Catholicism in England, the persecuted Christians fled to Geneva, Switzerland. Now, I don't know the whole story of the Waldensians, but evidently it was during this period of time that the Waldensians, who are the founders of Valdes, which it would be Waldo or, or Waldes, uh, they, they came and settled in this country, and they called themselves the keepers of the book. I don't know all the details about that and how, how accurate their history is, but again, the Geneva Bible was the Bible when this country was started that the early pilgrims used in this country in the 1600s. Now, the Geneva Bible gave rise to the Rooms de Douai Bible and the Bishop's Bible, and then after that we have the King James Bible. Now friends, how many translations, if you're a King James only person, I want to, I want to talk to you right now. In 1611, King James commissioned a trans, an English translation of the Bible that would be taken from the original texts. We've just talked about about 12 different copies of the Bible that people had before the King James Bible. Look at the chart. Were there versions of English Bibles before the 1611? Mm -hmm. So what would make the 1611 version, King James Bible, any more preferred than the Tyndall Bible? Or the Matthews Bible? Or the Great Bible? Or the Geneva Bible? They all, all those that I just mentioned came from original texts. So you see, folks, although we need to be very confident that we have a translation of Scripture, we need to make sure that we don't look and say our translation is superior to somebody else's because of this or because of that, unless it has something to do with accuracy of Scripture. So we need to be careful about this. And I'm not saying that the King James Version is wrong. I have, I, I prefer it in much of my preaching. And I use the American Standard Bible, which I believe personally to be superior to the King James Bible as far as its accuracy. So I don't make a big issue with people about what version they're using unless the version they are using is a perversion of the Scripture from the original. And many of these versions that are, quote, translations, they will say right on the very cover page, this is not a translation from the original text. Well, that'll tell you something right there. Be careful, beware right there. Well, the, the, again, we need to be careful, and if, uh, this is a word of caution to all of us, to make sure that, that we don't prefer one and say that's the only one that could ever give the idea. Actually, we don't have a handwritten copy from Paul of his letter to the Corinthians. But we do have the truth that was there, don't we? We do have an accurate, an accurate 
representation of what was done there and it's written down and it came from God and I believe that firmly. Let's go ahead and look at the King James Version for just a minute. King James uh, the first in line with an agreement he had with Puritan leaders assigned 54 scholars to create an authorized version of the Bible and authorized by him. Well, he, he had the people gathered from scholars from Oxford and Cambridge and Westminster working in six groups and they would compare and check one another. Now what he did that was different from others is that he not only used one scholar or two scholars, he used a group of scholars and had them compare their notes and check one another out to make sure that they were not giving a, st a stunted version. In 1611, after, uh, 11, after seven years, this Bible was published, being the first English version that did not have doctrinal notes. Now again, the English versions that were out, Matthew's Bible, the, the uh, Great Bible, other the, others of those, Tyndall, they had notes or commentaries on verses written in with the text. And so they, you can separate those out and read the accurate version that they had, but they would put in their ideas in with it. And the King James Version did not do that. Now, again, it was taken from much of the Tyndall text. There was much of it that it compared exactly with what Tyndall did. So again, 80 to 90 percent of the King James Bible is, is accurate to the point of being almost synonymous with the Tyndall Bible. In 1873, the Church of England issued a revision, which is what is called today the King James Version. Now that didn't come along till over 200 years later. And that is what a lot of people talk about in this area where you have to go back to a 1611 version of the King James. Well, the 1873 version is almost a, a carbon copy of what the 1611 version was with just but few exceptions. So the King James Version, I've got a copy of it up here and you can't really see it closely, but I would urge you to look at it. The look of it changed. This is King James. Now you, you read that. Acts 2.38, Peter said unto them, but notice the spellings, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of signs. Now that's sins, but would you know that? Again, the original 1611 King James Bible, very hard. Now this is taken from Tyndale in this version that we just read. But look at the Geneva Bible. Peter said unto them, Repent of your sins and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's the Great Bible in 1540. 1562, Peter said unto them, Amend your lives and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Do they say the same thing? Yeah. That's the Coverdale Bible. The Bishop's Bible, Peter said unto them, Repent ye, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Look at the different years, all saying the same thing. Now the meaning remains the same. The King James Version in 1873 and 1611 says this, Repent ye, and or repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So did Tyndall say the same thing? Mm hmm Coverdale, yeah. So be careful that you just prefer one version and say that's it, okay? Now, it's clear, it's clear that God preserves His Word, friends. And we have to be diligent to guard the accuracy of translations and the text behind them. The preservation of God's words in Matthew 5.18, I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle will by any means pass from the law until everything is fulfilled. 
All flesh is like grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever, friend. Well, look also. The Bible we read came to us by the shed blood of other people. The Bible still teaches the way of salvation today. And we can know the truth, and the truth will set us free. So how did we get the Bible? Well, manuscripts were discovered. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, Romans 8.1. Notice these versions, New King James, New American Standard. Again, all of these follow plenary verbal inspiration. And the Bible claims itself to be inspired. Well, let's look at a little, why do versions differ? Well, the style of the translation, changes in languages, and different text bases. In other words, did it come from the Masoretic text, the Dead Sea Scrolls? Did it come from Textus Receptus? Or, or any number of other texts of, of the original text? Well, as you and I look at what the Scriptures teach and try to find out in the modern versions that we have, what are we to know? What are we to think about as we look at those? Well, the old texts, and you'll see these, the oldest texts, the Aleppo, the oldest one is the Aleppo Codex. And again, from there we have, can we be confident that the Old Testament is true? Again, my word will be that which goes forth from my mouth, Isaiah 55. It shall not return to me void, but it will accomplish what I please, and it will prosper in what I want and what I have sent it for. Now again, God's providence is in His word. God will not allow, friends, and mark this, His Word to be lost forever. His providence has played a role in the preservation of the Scriptures. The Textus Receptus, or the Received Text, is one of the versions that people use today. And again, there's any number of different versions that can come up and that can be used. Now, as you and I look at it today, we look at our Bibles, we look at our translation, and we say, okay, which one do I use? Some would prefer to use the King James. Nothing wrong with that. Some would prefer to use the American Standard, which had 120 different translators and scholars of the day to go and to look at it and to get it all together and to discuss much like the King James people did. Put it all together so the American Standard would be one. And then we have the New American Standard and the New King James. New King James has basically taken out uh, all the language that is no longer relevant for us today, becoming a surety for someone, is translated differently. In other words, but the idea is the same, that you stand good for someone, that you co-sign for them. Uh, you stand good for their debt. And Christ did that for us. Well, and also it's taken out the these and the thous that are no longer uh, current language that we use. But they still, I think the New King James does keep the dignity of the King James. And I do, uh, I have my own thoughts on keeping the dignity of the beauty of the Scripture, particularly when you get to the poetry. And then we have the English Standard Version, which has some challenges. And also we have challenges with, uh, with some of the, with definitely with the NIV, because the NIV is, as some people say, the nearly inspired version. There's a lot of problems with the NIV. It teaches doctrinal issues that are just not found in the Scripture in certain texts. Now, can it be used to compare different things? I use it as I, as I do my own study, but I do not teach out of it. I won't do that. I use it as a reference book. And I use, I have a translation that uh, is 26 different versions all compared together. I use that to just compare languages as I go through in English. But the ones that I think you can easily rely on, and this is my opinion, based upon what I know from the texts, is that you can rely on the King James Version for the most part. It has some problems. One of the problems it has is the word hell and the using of the word hell when Hades is being talked about. 
and also not a differentiation between the grave and death and hell. And so there's, there has to be a difference there. And I think that was a mistake. The, the idea of putting Easter in the Bible. King, uh, King James did that. Now that was nothing in the world but something that was uh, used and a phrase that was used and was not something that was in the original text. No such thing as Easter at the, at the time of the original text. And so that would be something that was the term Passover would be in there, but it wouldn't be Easter. Well, again, the approximate time of the most ancient uh, writings that we have are much, much later. And the manuscripts we have of Plato, we have seven of them. The manuscripts we have of Homer, uh, he is the most we have, and he is about the, uh, 400 manuscripts of things that Homer said. The Bible far surpasses that by over 5,600 5, different ideas or di different um, texts that we have of the Scripture. So again, how do I know what version to use? New King James, King James, American Standard, New American Standard, and I want you to be cautious. ESV, again, I think there's a wonderful thing. It was, it was really supposed to, to replace the New American Standard, or the American Standard. But I think it's, it missed some things on that. And I, I once had great confidence in it. I don't have as much confidence in it now. But again, I do use it from time to time and use it when I'm preaching and teaching to compare something. But it uh, sometimes can take the language right out of what the intent of the, of the original was and leave out places, leave out whole comments that are there. Just doesn't even put them in. So again, 98% of the problems that people bring up about the Bible and the discrepancies in the Bible, 98% of them are spelling problems. Now, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2 grace and, be, and peace be multiplied to you in the, the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Savior. Now that's supposedly, uh, it's, it's supposed to say in knowledge and not in the knowledge. Again, that's an article issue, that's a punctuation issue, that's a, a grammar issue. Words or phrases omitted or substituted, in other words, using Jesus for Jesus Christ uh, those are some of the discrep quote discrepancies people say there are between the texts or between the translations, and why some people argue that you have to go back to the new to the King James. Well, again, these are the th these, this is kind of where we go with what the scriptures teach us today, and with what Bibles we can use. So, again, we have great evidence for the authenticity of the Bibles that we use, folks. You and I can depend on them. If you'd like copies of this lesson or any other lessons that we have, and there were some charts that we did not use in this presentation, and we would be glad to provide them to you free of charge because th this is important information. A lot of it was history. Somebody says, oh hey, yeah, I know you seem to like history. Well, I do like history, but I'll tell you this, um, it is history that gives us some of our faith. The Bible introduces these things. We've talked about how the Bible talks about when you read, you can understand. By inference, something had to be read. How did, how did we get it? How did it come down to us? Well, God did not choose to tell us all the details of that, but we have a record and we can trace it back. We can trace the Bible back to the original writers. Now, again, and more, more information of, of doing that on the Bible than any other book that exists or any writings of anybody we have that exists. But we take what Shakespeare says as fact. You know, it was written by Shakespeare. You don't know that. You weren't there. And there's only just a few texts. Now, I don't doubt that what we read from Shakespeare is from Shakespeare. But I'll tell you, there are people that do. There are always skeptics. So do we have a record? Do we have some way to trace back? Do we? have a record to know that what we were reading, and many of you are reading your Bible through, you're already through Genesis if you're reading, started out this year reading the Bible, already to the, to the time of uh, Joseph probably, 
And so, if you're reading your Bible, are the words something that you can rely on? Is it in fact the Word of God? We all say it is. Can I prove it? And you can. And we've tried to do that as we've gone through our study. I want to invite you to the Newton Church of Christ. It meets at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. Meeting every Sunday um, for Bible study at 930, for the worship at 11, and Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. And also, if you would like to contact the Newton Church of Christ, you can go to email at contact at wordandsword.com. And you can also go by phone and call and call the building. Someone will get with you at 828-465-3009. So friends, just do that and contact us. You can go by mail at P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina, 28658. And also the website is www.wordandsword.com. Well, tune in again February the 4th and at 8 8 o'clock, and I'll be with you again during that time. And tune in then, and we'll present more from God's Word on any number of subjects. And so we'll be talking the next time about some different subjects and various subjects. And one of the lessons I'm going to be uh, talking about in the next few weeks is if I only had one more lesson to preach. If I had one sermon to preach, what would I preach? You ever thought about that? What would you preach if you only had one thing to say? I want to draw your attention to some things that I think you need to think about. In the last month, there's been two instances of people whose lives have been challenged and one of them lost theirs. And it happened totally unexpected. There's not a one of us that gets up in the morning and doesn't think we're going to make it through the day. But there's a lady who came to worship. She came to worship. She took the Lord's Supper. She went out with her husband. They went to a restaurant. And she was walking to the car afterwards. And not long afterwards, she breathed her last breath. She wasn't that old as we look at it. But she passed. That could, have, that could be you and that could be me. Lady just a, few, just a couple of days ago got up, got ready to go to work, was in the shower, got ready to get out of the shower, came out. She, her, she called her husband on the phone, said, I don't feel good. Had a massive heart attack. Touch and go for a long time. Still juries out about neurological damage. That could be you and that could be me. Friends, get your soul where it needs to be. Take care of your soul and make sure you're obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ because any one of us can be overtaken by death at any time. It's not, a, it's not something to scare somebody about. It happens. Very real. Come back and be with us February 4th. Been very kind tonight. Good evening.